Welcome to our October Colloquium. Uh, this is the only one we have in October. And uh, today we have Clara Kuhner, and she will tackle the question, why don't we act in times of planetary crisis? Explaining cognitive action barriers from a climate psychology perspective. And uh, Ms. Kuhner is the MSCL evaluation coordinator, and she studies psychology at the LMU and the University of Bambiab, focusing on work and organizational psychology and social psychology. She has submitted her doctoral thesis on the connections between work and employee well-being to the University of Leipzig and is expected to receive her PhD at the end of this year. Her work combines various statistical methods such as di diary studies and meta-analysis. While working on her dissertation, Clara was a consultant. She gave lectures on work and organizational psychology and has been invited by various institutions, um, such as the Academy for Politische Bildung, to give talks and workshops on climate psychology. Welcome, Ms. Kuhner, and we're looking forward to hearing about this topic today. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Paulina. Uh, I'll first try to share my screen. Mm -hmm. Can you all see that? Yes. Okay, and let's just let me get my notes. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Also a warm welcome from my side. I'm very happy that I can present today here with this topic. As Paulina already said, I'm at the MSCL since September as evaluation coordinator. I specialized in work in organizational psychology during my PhD. But I also started working on climate psychology, other personal interests, really. And then I started giving workshops and seminars on that subject at various institutions. So today I'm here not in my role as evaluation coordinator, but as a psychologist, a climate psychologist. And I will present various um, topics of uh, research pieces in this area. It's not my own research. Um, but from other uh, very intelligent uh, scientists. And the topic today is why don't we act in times of planetary crisis? And I will try to give you some answers to these questions um, regarding cognitive action barriers um, through a climate psychology lens. And I will do the talk in English, but um, I'm happy to answer questions in English and German after that. And uh, just to warn you, it will take 30 minutes, but I think we then will still have enough time to discuss. Okay, so let's start. Um, before uh, we begin, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of the different topics of climate psychology. So maybe you were wondering why climate psychology, what is that? So the first area is climate emotions and mental well-being. Um, what feelings are associated with the climate crisis? Maybe you've heard of climate anxiety, grief, so that's telgia, guilt, everything like that. Especially um, what effects does the climate crisis have on the mental well-being of young people? Connected to that, the topic of climate resilience. How can we become mentally resilient towards negative climate emotions? But also the part of psychological support for activists and politicians. Uh, because this can be people who are dealing with the climate crisis a lot and they can be psychologically burdened and psychologists offer coaching and counseling or focusing on self-care etc then we have psychological crisis intervention so when climate catastrophes actually happen such as storms or floods and um, psychologists are there to provide psychological first aid uh, to people who have just lost their homes or families and have been traumatized then we have the, the whole topic of climate communication. How can we communicate um, the um, reasons and the solutions to the climate crisis effectively? Then we have the topic of explaining the knowledge action gap, which is my part today, and the topic of motivating climate-friendly behavior. So this is just a brief overview of the most important topics of the climate psychology. And I want to say that the climate crisis is as much a psychological crisis as anything else, because it's caused by human action and it can only be solved through human action. And psychology is the study of human behavior. So psychology actually plays a huge role in solving this crisis, which is why um, a lot of scientific and um, voluntary psychological associations have focused on the topic. For example, the APA has um, introduced a task force on the topic and the German pendant um, as well. And we have a lot of voluntary organizations such as Psychologists for Future who are dealing with all of the topics on the left side. So this is just to give you an overview of what climate psychology actually does. 
Today, I'm going to be talking about um, the knowledge action gap, and we will also touch a little bit on the subject of climate communication and motivating climate friendly behavior, but the focus is on this knowledge action gap. Okay, so. Um, let me first show you the knowledge action gap. I think um, everyone here in this room knows that the climate crisis poses an extreme risk to our health, to humanity in, in general. And um, actually, a lot of people know that. Um, here's a graph from the World Economic Forum from the Global Risks Report in 2021. I pretty, like, I pretty much like this graph. Um, and the x-axis, you can see the likelihood of various um, global uh, risks. And on the y-axis, you can see the impact these um, risks have on our well-being, on humanity. And as you can see, um, climate action failure not only has a really high impact on humanity, but is also very likely. And um, so we know that the climate crisis is something we have to do something about. Uh, very urgently, um, and this is also mirrored in uh, the journalistic landscape. I have some examples from um, New York Times. Al Gore said that the climate crisis is the battle of our time. Obama said that the trends are terrifying, and uh, lately Guterres said that humanity faces collective suicide. So it's pretty serious. Climate crisis is pretty serious, and we have actually known this for a very long time. So the worst the first World Climate Conference was in 1979. So if you see all that, you would think, okay, um, we will do everything we can to solve this problem immediately. But unfortunately, we don't. So this is a graph from the Climate Action Tracker. It shows warming projections, maybe you know this graph, um, by the year of 2100. And the upper line are the current policies and actions. So if we carry on as we do right now, we will have at, at least 2.5 degrees more by 2100. The green line is consistent with the um, Paris Climate Protection Agreement, uh, the 1.5 degree. And as you can see, there is a huge gap between what we should do and what we are actually doing. And I found an article in the Süddeutsche Zeitung and I thought the author um, asked an excellent question, which was, how can it be explained that rational, highly informed people aren't trying everything they can right now to limit the impacts of climate change as best they can, each and every one of them? So basically each and every one of us uh, as well. And I thought it's an excellent, uh, excellent question. It's quite complex to answer. And today I will try to give you some insights how this can be answered. So why, why is this gap? Why don't we do everything we can? So there are different action barriers, and you can roughly divide them into, into individual barriers, social barriers, and systemic structural um, barriers. Um, on, I, I tried to make it not too theoretical, so I selected four pieces of research um, that I thought were very descriptive and um, relatable. Uh, and these are the theory of cognitive dissonance, the seven dragons of inaction, the social identity model of pro-environmental action and the discourses of climate delay. Um, some, of, some aspects of these uh, theories overlap, but they all use different approaches. And as you can see, most of them center around the individual barriers. Only two of them also dip into the other kinds of barriers. Um, I don't want to say that systemic structural barriers are not important because they are extremely important, they, because they are the context um, in which we can behave and um, there are often systemic hurdles um, that cannot be overlooked or ignored because um, it makes it difficult for, for people to behave climate friendly um, when there isn't the, the right infrastructure to do that. So we have a lot of barriers here, infrastructure, but also legislation, the economic system, power structures and everything. And these systemic uh, barriers, of course, have to be removed wherever possible. However, um, individual barriers are just as important because re research shows that um, just getting rid of this structural barriers is not enough. Each and every one of us has to change the way we live. And, and almost for everyone, adopting more pro-environmental behavior is possible, but it's currently not occurring due to various psychological barriers. This is why I will set a focus here, but again, it's important to also keep in mind the systemic barriers. Okay, 
So let's start. Ah, yeah, and in the end, I forgot that. I will try to derive some implications of these four pieces of research for science communication or communication in general on climate change. Okay, so let's start with the first theory. It's the theory of cognitive dissonance. Maybe you're familiar with the concept. And um, the first thing is you have to understand that human cognition does not work like a computer because it's far less rational. It's far less rational than we all would think and also than we once believed. And um, the work by Daniel Kahneman, maybe you know him, you won a Nobel Prize in economics. He made a series of experiments showing that we humans, we are not rational at all. Uh, we use a lot of cognitive uh, shortcuts and heuristics and stereotypes and biases. And that's a good thing uh, because this helps us to process the information in our environment. We have a very complex reality. And to get along with all of this, these biases and shortcuts, they help us for, um, not to be overwhelmed. So that's a good thing, but we will understand why in the face of climate crisis, it's not so good. Okay, so this concept originates in social psychology. It's a very old concept and it's applicable to a lot of situations of daily lives really. Um, the basic concept is a cognitive um, dissonance, which is an aversive inattention that um, originates from two contradictory elements of knowledge or behavior. And um, every time we have such a dissonance, we want to reduce it because it costs us a lot of energy. So we want to create congruence and we want to reduce the dissonance. What does this uh, mean in the sense of climate crisis? The first element is we know that the climate crisis threatens our well-being. And the second element is we know that many aspects of our daily actions are directly related to the climate crisis. So there's a dissonance. We know climate crisis is not good, but we are all producers of the climate crisis. So there's a dissonance and this is not, we don't like that. Our brain doesn't uh, like that. So what can we do to close this gap? There are two possibilities. We could change our behavior and act in a more in a climate friendly way or we could change our cognition. Regarding climate change, changing behavior can be really difficult because it involves changing habits. It can be expensive. It can be time consuming. You may have to give up comfort. Changing cognition is much easier um, when it comes to climate change. Um, as a Skinner, as a psychologist once said, it's often easier to escape in other ways by ignoring or forgetting the advice or by finding a way to escape that does not require solving the problem. And actually, there are a lot of different um, strategies, cognitive strategies, to reduce this dissonance on a cognitive rather than on a behavioral um, level. Again, these uh, strategies are natural mechanisms to protect us, to protect our psychological resources. But when it comes to climate crisis, there is also a danger because they prevent us from really dealing with the climate crisis. And also it can contribute to building up fears and secrecy, uh, create mental illnesses, um, et cetera. So I will show you some of these uh, strategies to reduce the tension uh, via cognitive strategies. And there are a lot of them, I chose six, and I chose them basing on what I thought were really common mechanisms and also really relatable mechanisms. So you may find that you yourself apply these mechanisms. I can say I've applied all of them. So it's, it's totally normal that you do. So the first is avoidance. We can just keep the threatening information away from our conscious awareness. We can say, I don't wanna know all about this climate stuff. It's too overwhelming. I just, I don't wanna hear it. A second strategy is the so-called optimism bias where we um, discount the personal risk to be affected by the climate crisis. Yeah, it's all very bad, but in Germany, we won't, we won't notice it. Then we have single action bias. Um, when the pressure to act in a climate friendly way gets, uh, gets high, you, you can decrease this by doing just one climate friendly action. For example, okay, I stop eating meat, then it's not so bad if I fly on vacation, for example. So one action is enough to uh, feel, feel more comfortable. Then we have the confirmation bias. And so we seek for information that fit our attitudes. Um, we select information that fit in what, in what we already 
think we know and uh, we sort out information that contradict our attitudes. Then we have shifting responsibility. Um, uh, so we, we would fade out the share of our own responsibility of the situation and say, okay, the others, uh, the others are so bad. Um, you probably hear a lot, okay, China is producing so much CO2, it's not our fault. And then we have the bystander effect. Um, so there are so many people who could solve the climate crisis. Why should I do something? Or I can't do anything. I'm just a little uh, person, let the others do it. And um, so these are just some mechanisms, uh, cognitive mechanisms, how you could reduce this dissonance without having to change your actual behavior. And yeah, you, you can think about maybe some of them sound familiar, maybe you have experienced them, maybe you have um, friends or family who apply them. Again, it's normal, but we have to be aware of them and we have to work against them to actually deal with the problem on a behavioral level. Okay, so that was the first piece of research. The second one are the seven dragons of inaction and the psychologists for future created this um, little graph uh, with the seven dra dragons. It's only available um, in German, but I find it uh, cute. <laughs> so I added it on this um, slide. The topic is not uh, cute at all, but the graph is. Um, this is a work by a psychologist called uh, Robert Gifford, and he published this in 2011 in the American Psychologist. And this is like the highest impact factor psychological journal there is. And what he did, he combined various psychological theories, so from various fields of psychology, and identified 29 dragons of inaction and organized them in seven dragon families. So we don't have time to go through all of the 29 dragons, but I will give an example for every dragon family. And um, the first is limited cognition. It's pretty similar to what we just had. Um, for example, perceived uncertainty. Um, as soon as individuals interpret any sign of uncertainty within scientific findings, that is a sufficient reason um, for less pro-environmental behavior. For example, if the IPCC report says it's likely or it's very likely that that and that will happen, which they have to do out of um, scientific rigor, um, people can interpret this as lower likelihood than the IPCC intended to. And this can lead to an underestimation of climate change. Then we have the topic of perceived behavioral control. People fear they have little control over the outcomes or their actions regarding climate change, so they won't act because it doesn't matter what I do. Okay, then we have ideologies. You may be familiar with technosalvation, that technology alone can save us. For example, geoengineering can solve all, all our problems. Comparison with other people, we are social animals, we compare our behavior with that of others and we derive um, norms from um, um, observing others. And for example, if you're in a group where the norm is to drive a big and fast car, you will probably do that and not behave in a pro-environmental way. Just an example. Then we have the family of sunk costs, when you have invested in a big house, in an expensive vacation, whatever, and you don't want to give that up because people are loss aversive and they don't want to throw away such expenses. Then we have the family of discredits, for example, mistrust. And this is actually quite important. Um, when uh, people mistrust science or scientists, they are much less likely to behave in a pro-environmental way and actually such trust can be easily damaged and if there is mistrust resistance in one form or another will likely emerge then we have the family of perceived risks for example there is a functional risk of pro-environmental alternatives or financial risk and the last family is one of limited behavior so for example you have understood that you have to behave in a different way but still there is a limitation in that behavior for example the rebound effect you may be familiar with that and um, so after some mitigating effort, these gains are erased by your subsequent actions. So for example, okay, you bought an electric car, but then you drive twice as much as you did before and use up a lot of, use up a lot of energy. So that's a classical rebound effect. So this, this, it's not a theory really, it's just a, um, a collection of different 
um, kinds of inaction, and there are 29 of them, and they're all very applicable um, to daily life. And if you're interested, I, I recommend reading this article by Robert Gifford, or maybe later we can talk about some other practice. Okay, now the third piece of research I wanted to show you. This is a work by Lamp et al. It was um, published in 2020. Uh, and they um, discovered various discourses of climate delay, and thereby they focused on policy-focused discourses, so on politics. And um, they systematically researched news articles and media content on climate policies in Germany, I think the UK and the US. And they identified four groups of climate delay discourses which are redirect responsibility, push non-transformative solutions, emphasize downsides, and surrender. And um, we don't go through all of them because it takes too much time. I will just pick some and I also have some examples. Um, just to warn you, these climate delay excuses are extremely common. And once you're sensitized for them, you will discover them all the time and everywhere. Maybe you will feel the same after today. And another warning, these discourses can be very compelling because all of them build on legitimate concerns and fears. So they all have a bit of truth in them, but they can become delay arguments when they misrepresent or when they raise adversity or when they imply that taking action is impossible. Okay, so let's start with the first, individualism. So the strategy here is to push responsibility onto individuals, arguing that they should take appropriate decisions as consumers, for example. And this avoids this, the discussion of corporate responsibility and also ignores problems of power. And I have an example, or actually two examples. On the left, it, this is a campaign uh, by BP. Uh, they introduced the first um, carbon footprint calculator. Why would they do that? To push responsibility on individual and the individual and to distract from their own corporate responsibility. On the right side, we have Ben van Boyden. He's the CAO of Shell. And in the Times, he said, I like to point out to my daughters that having something new for every season four times a year is creating quite a significant ecological footprint. Have you realized that? Because they are all about climate change. So I imagine that his daughter said, hey, dad, you're the CEO of Shell. Do you know that Shell is highly responsible as an oil company for the climate crisis? And he applied this individualism strategy and said, yeah, but what about you? You buy new clothes every season. Okay, then we have an effect called the free rider excuse. So the strategy here is um, to say, to mistrust other nations, to say, okay, when we take, um, we take measures for, um, uh, to protect uh, climate, uh, ourselves from the climate crisis, others will take advantage of us. So when we reduce our emissions, others will take advantage and increase their emissions. And this really just encourages a race towards the bottom. And so that's the narrative that the own country is playing too nice and the others are devious and they will take advantage. Actually, it's a key ingredient of nationalism. There's an example. So this is uh, Josh Manuatu. He's the president of the Australian Young Liberals. Um, and this was a um, TV duel. And he said, if we stopped emitting altogether tomorrow, not only it would have no impact, but undoubtedly other countries would simply increase their emissions. So this narrative, okay, if we decrease this, others will take advantage. Then the strategy I, I really like, uh, the no sticks, just carrots strategy, which suggests that climate action should consist exclusively of enticing incentives. So carrots and avoid any restrictions or regulations um, sticks, uh, because these are unacceptable for the population. Evidence shows that we will need both. We will need incentives, of course, incentives to behave in a more uh, pro-environmental way, but we will also need regulations. Here's an example, this is Andrea Scheuer. 
Um, and he said, my approach is that I want more options rather than bans. Banning, that's the Greens approach. They want to prescribe how people should travel. There will be no paternalism and tax increases with me. I expect much from incentives. So this, that's another strategy. Then the appeal to social justice. Um, this strategy frames climate mitigation as a social justice issue, which it is. Um, but it focuses on the, on the short-term costs of a transition. And while it downplays the long-term benefits um, of climate protection. So um, often used topics are job losses, for example, in the coal and automotive industries. Um, but it doesn't mention um, other social uh, justice uh, aspects, for example, improving public health through climate action. There's an example, this is UK Treasury Minister Robert Jenrick, and he said that the last Labour government tripled air passenger duty and any new tax would hammer hardworking families and prevent them from enjoying their chance to go abroad. Of course, we have to consider social justice when you talk about measures against the climate crisis, but they cannot be used as an excuse or um, to do nothing. So we have to do both. We need the regulations and we need the incentives. We cannot count on incentives only. And then the last one is doomism. So that's a strategy that says it's all lost anyway. It, it, it doesn't matter what we do. Um, so it takes the responsibility from the individuals because we are lost anyway. There is an example. This is a, um, a piece of uh, an article in uh, the New Yorker. What if we stop pretending the climate ap ap apocalypse is coming? And uh, to prepare for it, we need to admit that we can prevent it. And of course, um, such a mindset will also not lead to climate action. So these are just some examples from this taxonomy by uh, Lamp. There are a lot of others. And as I said, they're very common. They all build on legitimate concerns, um, but they cannot be used to delay climate action, necessary, highly necessary climate action. And then the last piece of research I wanted to show, it's a social identity model of pro-environmental action by uh, um, Imo Fritsche and colleagues. He's a social psychology uh, professor in Leipzig. And this is uh, actually a quite interesting model because it goes beyond this personal level predictors um, because it, um, it challenges this individualistic view and says, okay, we're social animals and um, we, we live and work in groups. And so we have to consider this from a group perspective. And um, this uh, theory is based on uh, social, uh, the social identity um, approach. And it's de it is designed that it applied, can be applied to any group um, actually. And um, the model involves three social identity processes that determine environmental appraisals and pro-environmental behavior. So here we dip a little bit into how can we motivate people to act in a climate-friendly way. And uh, these uh, social identity processes are driven by emotions and motivation. So he also considers appraisals in this model. You may be familiar with the appraisal concept. It's very, it's an important part of uh, transactional stress theory. And so um, every one of us appraises the environmental crisis as relevant or irrelevant or harmful or not harmful. And when you come to the inclusion that the environmental crisis is for you relevant and harmful, this will induce emotions such as anger or fear anxiety and these emotions then um, trigger or fuel those collective processes related to the three social identity variables. And these are in-group identification. And so every one of us clearly categorize oneself in a, in a group and we feel invested in groups, for example, uh, other pupils, our neighbors, depending on your groups your family, for example, and um, people who identify strongly with their own group will also act in the interests of the group. So when you're part of an environmental climate movement, you will also act in, in the interests of this specific group. 
Then we have collective efficacy beliefs. Uh, we already talked about this. Um, um, it's the same as perceived behavioral control. Uh, when you feel that your group uh, you're a member of can influence uh, things. For example, when you're in a group and have the feeling, okay, our group can really do something about the climate crisis, it's much more likely that you will act. And then we have um, in-group norms and goals. So they will give your actions direction and purpose. And um, so the, when the norm of your group is uh, to protect the environment, you will much more likely behave in a pro-environmental way. And the theory also proposes that these uh, three variables, these social identity variables interact in predicting pro-environmental behavior. So this is another approach um, taking into account the collective um, uh, in a theory. And I think it's, it's a, a good addition a good addition to those individual approaches. Okay, so that was the last um, theory. And I tried to summarize the four pieces of research I showed you today. Um, as concisely as possible and five points, five recommendations for science communication or communication in general of climate change. And of course, there are a number uh, of other best practice recommendations and guidelines for climate communication. This, this is a whole separate branch of research. So this list is non-exhaustive, but it's just uh, a try of me to summarize what I showed you today, the most important points I see from these four uh, theories. Okay, the first thing is we have to keep communicating the scientific facts and the personal relevance of climate change. This is the bottom line. And we have to do this in a variety of formats and outlets, and we have to reach as many target groups as possible. So that's the first thing. Then we need to find ways to increase trust in science. As I said, as, as soon as there is mistrust or a perceived uncertainty in scientific findings, people are much less likely to act in pro-environmental ways. So we need to find formats where people can meet scientists, get in contact with scientific findings, and understand normal scientific uncertainty so that they can build trust. Then we also need to inform about misinformation and about such climate delay discussion and cognitive biases so people can be aware of them and make their own opinions without being biased by those biases. And the most important thing, that's why I made this, made this in bold, we need to strengthen individual and collective efficacy beliefs. So we need to present options for climate actions. What can people do? We need to communicate best practice examples um, of effective climate action. And finally, based on the last model, we can use the powers of social identity. For example, um, we can identify in-group members as ambassadors of climate action and use them as climate communicators because the group will take it much more likely from them than from others outside the group. So these are just five recommendations I would give um, uh, based on the, um, the things I showed you today. And um, yeah, to build a bridge, I'm an evaluation coordinator here. And um, so my focus in our science communication experiments, which also involve climate change topics, Will we to evaluate if we were successful in these parts of science communication? So were we able to build trust? Were we able to increase um, self-efficacy and stuff like that? And this is how these two parts um, interconnect. And um, yeah, that was a little insight into the psychological barriers uh, to climate action. Of course, there are many other theories and approaches. And this was just um, a, a little uh, um, overview. And um, these are all the references. I'm happy to send you the reference list or also the um, presentation if, you, if you're interested. And um, you can reach me via, via email. And um, yeah, now I'm, I'm happy to uh, discuss and uh, answer questions if I can. And um, yeah, in German or English, it's both, both fine.